Welcome to Raw Online. Today's class will be on pulse oximeter. I am Dr. T. Shyam. I am a consultant anesthesiologist. So, coming to the introduction, this pulse oximeter was introduced in 1980s. So, it became standard of care in 1987. The ASA recommended it to be a standard of care in 1987. But it has been gaining popularity since the early 1980s. It is a safe, simple and non-invasive method of assessing the status of oxygenation of the arterial blood. It is a non-invasive method. But the, the most important advantage of pulse oximeter is that it is a real time monitoring. It is not like you send a sample to a machine and comes back with the reading. It is a real time monitoring to help identify the hypoxemic episodes early inside the OR or outside the OR2. Coming to the definition, pulse oximetry is a non invasive monitoring technique used to estimate the measurement of arterial oxygen saturation of hemoglobin. The oxygen saturation is indicator of the percentage of hemoglobin saturated with the oxygen at the time of the measurement. For example, if the hemoglobin level is 15 grams per deciliter and if uh, 14 grams of that hemoglobin is uh, completely saturated with the oxygen, then the oxygen saturation will be 14 by 15 into 100. That will be around 93-94%. Coming to the history, this started in uh, 1935. Carl Mathes uh, developed the first oximeter to measure oxygen saturation and subsequent oximeters developed by HP were bulky and expensive. You can see an example uh, from the HP journal from 1970s. So, this was how uh, the oximeters looked before uh, 1970s. And this was uh, usually measured around the ear lobes. Then what happened was that uh, a Japanese electrical engineer, his name was Takuo Ayayagi. Uh, he was uh, in a company called Nikko Koden. Uh, he was trying to uh, measure the cardiac output by uh, fixed principle, dye washout technique. He was using the oximeter for this purpose. So, he was uh, measuring the cardiac output. What happened was that this pulsatile arterial waveforms was interfering with this measurement. So, this pulse oximetry was in reality a serendipity uh, discovery. He was trying to measure the cardiac output, but what he found was that when he was trying to cancel the pulsatile signals by matching the infrared and the red uh, spectrum of the oximeter, he was able to actually measure the uh, oxygen saturation in real time. So, that is how he uh, came up with the algorithms to uh, develop pulse oximeter. A company called Minolta, it uh, took over the technology from Nikko Koden and it successfully marketed this invention in 1978. So, over the next 9 years, the adoption uh, to this technology was very rapid. And by 1987, ASA, American Society of Anesthesiology, recommended inclusion of this pulse oximetry and capnography into the operating room as standard of care. So, this is uh, electrical engineer Takuo Ayogi. He was uh, facilitated in the IEEE conference in 2014. This picture was taken at that time. So, whatever we have seen is part of the history of uh, the pulse oximetry. And of course, we saw the introduction and uh, definitions. So, this is where the exam part starts. Like, if they ask about pulse oximetry, these are the points you have to remember. So, the principles of pulse oximetry after the introduction and uh, definition, this is what you should know. The general principle of pulse oximetry is based on the Beer Lambert law. So, what is Beer Lambert law? I will come to each of them in uh, isolation in the next slides. So, what they do is they measure the transmission of the red light. Red light is 600 to 715 nanometer of wavelength, it is in the visible uh, spectrum. For this pulse oximetry, 660 nanometer is usually used. But again, this is not like a laser and all, it is not an exact 660. Of course, uh, nearby uh, uh, wavelengths uh, will also be incident on the probe. So, uh, 600 to 750 nanometer uh, red color and infrared uh, wavelength between 850 to 1000 uh, nanometer. So, the precise wavelength is 940 nanometer is what is used in uh, pulse oximetry. Again, it is not like a laser, it is approximate uh, wavelength. So, this wavelength, the lights uh, will pass through the pulsatile tissue bits which subsequently determines the light absorption characteristics of oxygenated and deoxygenated blood. How this is done, we will see uh, later in the lecture. So, coming first to the Beer law. Beer law states that the absorption is proportional to the concentration of the absorption species. So, higher the concentration, higher the absorption. So, it is a very simple law, it is a very intuitive law. So, Beer law states that the absorption is proportional to the concentration of the species you are measuring. Coming to the Lambert law, Lambert law states that the absorption is proportional to the light path length. For example, if it has to transverse a lot of length through a solution containing that substance, then the absorption will be higher. If it is just a small film, then the absorption will be lower. So, again a very intuitive law. So, you just have to remember which is which. Beer law is about the concentration, Lambert law is about the length of the solution. So, B, C and L, L, very easy to remember. 
Beer's law is the concentration and Lambert law is the length, light part length. So combining the beer Lambert's law, the beer Lambert's law is the linear relationship between the absorbance species. So for example, absorbance is given as A, it is proportional to the concentrate, it is proportional to the length, so B. So A is proportional to B into C. So you introduce a constant, then A is equal to a constant into B into C into C. This is a constant. This constant is given by A lambda. What is A lambda? A lambda is the wavelength dependent absorptivity which is specific to each substance. What we get the equation is the A is equal to A lambda into B into C where B is the path length and C is the concentrate. So this is Beer Lambert law, very simple. So coming to the oxygen saturation, as I have already told the definition, oxygen saturation is defined as the ratio of oxygen content to the oxygen capacity of the hemoglobin expressed as a percentage. So if 15 grams of hemoglobin is there, if 14 grams is saturated with oxygen, then the percentage will be 93-94 percentage. Coming to the difference between SpO2 and uh, SaO2, SpO2 is the saturation of the oxygen blood which is measured by the pulse oximeter and SaO2 is the saturation of arterial blood which is measured by the ABG. Coming to the relationship between the SaO2 and partial pressure of oxygen, all else being equal, SaO2 depends upon the value of PaO2. So this is why I am saying all else being equal because this curve can be shifted left or right due to various factors that is outside the scope of this presentation. But please remember that SaO2 is directly related to the PaO2. If PaO2 increases, the saturation also will increase if the partial pressure of oxygen decreases the saturation also decrease which is given by the ODC curve oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve. So for example 97 percent saturation is usually seen when the partial pressure of oxygen is 97. 90 percent saturation is seen when the PaO2 is 60 and 80 percent saturation is seen when the PaO2 is 45. In adults 50 percent saturation the so called P50 is 27. 27 PaO2 we get a saturation of 50 percent. <laughs>